Well, let's see. So, so far after eight days, you've learned that you can die from the air, from the water, from the food, uh, from the medicines that you take to fix the problems caused by the air, the water, and the food, and that the government will do nothing about it. So, so I'm here to tell you that that's the, that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that uh, without water, you die within a few days. So don't worry about cancer and diabetes. You'll be long gone from dehydration before you ever get to that point in time. So. Uh, you know, it's funny that we can laugh about it here in the United States because worldwide they can't. And when you look around the world at what's happening, you see more than a billion people lack access to safe drinking water. A billion people. That's more than three times the population of the United States. Uh, more than two billion people lack access to good sanitation. And that translates directly into various waterborne uh, diseases intestinal problems, and a couple of million people die just from those kinds of diseases, including cholera, every day. So when you look at what the situation is in the United States, we are incredibly lucky to have the water supply that we have. And yet, I think you will be surprised by some of the things I'm going to say this morning about the nature of the crisis in the United States. So I want to proceed in three steps. First, I want to just sort of quickly sketch out what's happening around the country, and it's not just the West by any means. Then second, I'd like to talk about both real solutions, but also a few things that I call surreal solutions. And then finally, I'd like to talk about things that we could be doing in the United States, but are, are not uh, currently, currently doing. So first, uh, I live in Arizona now. I grew up in the East in Massachusetts. And one of the great uh, iconic Western writers, Ed Abbey, once said, there's plenty of water in the Mojave Desert unless you should try to establish a city where no city should be. Well, that, of course, is the city of Las Vegas. And here is the Bellagio Fountain. It is the iconic uh, emblem of Las Vegas. For some people, it's the reason to go to Las Vegas. For others, it's the reason to detest Las Vegas. Uh, the fountain alone cost $40 million. Uh, the fountain holds 27 million gallons of water. It has an eight-acre footprint. It has 250 heads that shoot water as high as 250 feet into the desert sky. It does seem to many people the epitome of wretched excess. Uh, but it isn't. It's really only the beginning. How many of you know about City Center in Las Vegas? A couple people. It's, uh, it's the latest development on the Strip. It's a 76-acre footprint. It has six uh, skyscrapers ranging in, in, in height from 36 to 61 stories. Um, at build-out, there will be an additional 50,000 people brought into Vegas onto the Strip. And the funny thing about this build uh, this, this setting, is its scale for one. And if you look to the side of the, of the photograph, way on the left, see that little shadow? That's the Monte Carlo Casino. That's, uh, that's one of the biggest casinos on the Strip, and yet it looks like a child's toy compared to what's going in uh, next to it. Another striking thing is that there is only one casino in this entire complex. It's not about gaming. It's not about gambling. It's about the amenities of what Las Vegas brings. People from all over the U.S., from, from Canada, from the EU, from the Pacific Rim, are plunking down large chunks of cash for condos on the Las Vegas Strip, not to gamble, but for the nightlife, for the clubs, the entertaining, the boutiques, the fine dining, the shopping, every, virtually every famous chef has a venue in, uh, on the Las Vegas Strip. That's what's bringing people to Las Vegas. But there's a problem, and it's a serious problem. And the problem is that Las Vegas has run out of water. And the head of the Southern Nevada Water Authority, Patricia Mulroy, until she retired a few months ago, was a little late in coming to this realization, but she eventually realized that they had a problem, and she became a convert to conservation. And like many converts to religion or other isms, uh, she had a passion and a, and a, and a, and a deter determination to do something about it. So one of the things she did was immediately start to pay people to rip out their lawns. That was $200 per square foot. I'm sorry, $2 per square foot. And they, she put $200 million on the table to do this. So if you look around Las Vegas now, you'll see a fraction of the lawns that you used to see. The next thing she did is she offered to build 
desalinization plants for the cities of Tijuana and San Diego on the Pacific coast, in turn, she would take their Colorado River water out of Lake Mead. Third thing she did, she embarked on building a three billion, that's with a B, billion dollar pipeline to import groundwater from the central part of Nevada on the border with Utah. And the people up there didn't think this was such a good idea. Uh, the big city coming in and taking away their water. And if you think about your American history, you realize that the people up in that area were some of the original pioneers, the settlers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Um, and they're unhappy. But from my perspective, as a lawyer who finds fights over water fascinating, what could be better than a fight that pits Sin City against the Mormons? <laughs> There's one other thing that Pat Mulroy did to try to persuade people to save water, and that is she ran public service announcements uh, uh, like the following one. So think about how well this would play in, in your home community. To find your watering schedule, go to changeyourclock.com. So Las Vegas has a different sense about what's appropriate for television than some other communities. All right, well, let me get this straight. So she's threatening you with bodily harm. She's trying to steal the Mormon's water. But how can she possibly justify the water use on the Strip? The Bellagio Hotel, the, the Venetian lagoons, the pirate uh, lakes and the like. Well, actually, pretty easily. Because when Steve Wynn, the developer of the Bellagio, came to her with this proposal, he said, look, I just got to have a water feature. That's my concept of the Bellagio. And so she, she said to him, OK, Steve, are you prepared to double plumb the hotel? Are you prepared to build a reverse osmosis system and treat up the con contaminated water? Are you prepared to install low flow fixtures, instant hot water? She had a long list. And he said yes. And he did. And they all did. And so in fact that, that, that fountain, it's all recycled water. As are all of the water features on the Strip. The stunning thing about Las Vegas is despite the appearance of of a, a profligate water use, it's incredibly water efficient. The Strip only uses 3% of Las Vegas' water, and yet they are the driver of the economy of the state of Nevada, second to none. Now in Nevada, as in every state, farmers use most of the water. It takes a heck of a lot of water to irrigate. Uh, in Nevada, that's upwards of 80% of the water is used by farmers. In Nevada, that supports a farm community, a farm economy, of about 6,000 jobs. 6,000 jobs is about the same number of jobs as one casino creates. So if you start to think about the economic value of water, what you realize is that they have a cash cow in the strip. And what you realize is that we have been undervaluing water for a long time. And so despite Las Vegas' naughty slogan, about what happens there stays here. When it comes to water, it's the furthest from the truth. And what you're seeing right now as we sit here this morning in Southern California are cities paying people to rip out lawns, just like Pat Mulroy pioneered 10 or 15 years ago. So one of our wisest founding fathers, Ben Franklin, once said that when the well's dry, we know the worth of water. Great quote. He was wrong. The fact is, we Americans are spoiled. When we wake up in the morning, we turn on that tap, and out comes as much water as we want for less than we pay for cell phone service or for cable television. When most of us think of, the, think of water, we think of it as like the air, as infinite and inexhaustible, when for all practical purposes, it's very finite and quite exhaustible. So the crisis. <clears throat> This is a drought monitor map from uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the rains in Texas would change that a bit in Oklahoma in the last few days. 
but uh, probably not to eliminate the drought that's been going on. Of course, the bullseye is California and Oregon and, and Nevada, that dark, dark, deep, terrible color for the most extreme drought um, imaginable. But Texas has not been immune. They've been in drought for four years. In a little town called Plainview, the Cargill Meatpacking Company closed there two years ago. There just wasn't enough cattle for them to process, to, and so they closed the plant. And you want to talk about devastation to a community. The plant employed 2,300 people. The entire population of the town was 22,000. So all the good jobs gone in, 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 the, in a flash. Really incredible value associated with water. Here's a photograph of just a couple months ago, well actually four months ago, in January of this year, of the High Sierra. This is taken at about 8,000 feet. And for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with what should be happening in a mountain in the West, you shouldn't see land. You shouldn't see dirt. All you should see is yards of snow. And sometimes it would be as high as the ceiling in this room. This is the water supply for the state of California. Not the only one, but a very, very Im important one. And it is very, very bleak. Um, here's Lake Mead, which is the water supply somewhat for California, but also for six other uh, western states, including my own of Arizona. That bathtub ring around it shows you just how low it is. Lake Mead has not been lower since they built the dam in the 1930s. And we have basically a structural deficit. There's more water being taken out of the system every year than there's water coming in. Well, it's like your bank account. You can't keep doing that. Eventually your bank account goes goes dry, and that's, that's what's um, happening here. The U.S. Bureau of Reclamation that runs the dams on the system predicts that maybe as early as next year, Nevada and Arizona are going to start to take shortages on the Colorado, Colorado River. But it's not just a Western problem, though it's an enormous Western problem. And it's not just an arid lands problem. It's also an Eastern problem and a humid problem. Um, this is Lake Lanier, which is the principal water supply for the city of Atlanta. This was about five years ago. And then uh, Lake Lanier came within 90 days of running out of water. For a population of four, four and a half million people, they almost ran out of water. Now, now as sensible people, you would think that, well, of course, Georgia officials took aggressive action to deal with this problem. But the odd thing is, you would be wrong. They didn't. Oh, to be sure, they passed some modest regulations on, uh, on watering uh, lawns, filling swimming pools, washing cars. They did do that, but not much else, and they still haven't. At the time, the governor finally decided he needed to do something dramatic, and so what he decided to do was to gather with people on the steps of the Capitol, ministers and people of faith, and to pray for rain. Now, now I have no doubt that prayer can be a powerful medium, no doubt whatsoever, but this governor wasn't a guy to take chances because he didn't schedule the prayer vigil until weather forecasters predicted it was going to rain. <laughs> then he had the prayer vigil. Funny thing, it rained. So the power, power, of, power of prayer. Then the state legislature got in the business. So see up at the top there, the border with Tennessee and the Tennessee River? So the Georgia legislature passed a resolution that said that the survey that set that border was wrong and that the state of Georgia should be moved one mile north which just serendipitously brings that little hook in, tennis, in the Tennessee River down into Georgia where they can insert their straws and start sucking away to their heart's content. What the state did not do, and still has not done, is limit groundwater pumping. You do not even need a permit to drill a well in Georgia unless you are going to pump more than 100,000 gallons of water per day. Then you need a permit, and the permit's easy to come by. So it's not just affecting Georgia, it's also affecting uh, Florida. And if you follow the river down to the Apalachicola River, you see that that ends up in an estuary down at, at the border in, in uh, that part of uh, Florida, just west of Tallahassee. It's quite a, a beautiful place. It's a major oyster fishery. I've spent some, some time down there. In fact, I, I got to go oystering with uh, one, of these, one of these fellows. And the way you do that is you have these giant rakes, about 15 feet tall, and you kind of muscle them together and you bring up 
mud and old clamshells and hopefully some new oysters and, uh, and you sort through them. So after, I had a personal insight from doing this, which was after about a very short time, I realized <coughs> I have a cushy academic job. So here's the other thing that was going on in Georgia at the time. How many of you know about Stone Mountain, a theme park? Yeah, theme park uh, just outside of Atlanta. So Stone Mar uh, Mountain partnered with Coca-Cola to create Snow Mountain. And they issued a press release saying that research had disclosed that very few Atlanta children had ever had a satisfactory snow experience. Uh, presumably this is because they live in Atlanta. But, you know, one hopes no PhDs were awarded for this sort of fine piece of research. So they decided to remedy it. And they decided to build this park outdoors and create snow outdoors in Georgia. And they did this in the middle of a drought on a day when the temperature hit 81 degrees Fahrenheit. And these characters are making snow outdoors. We humans have an infinite capacity to deny reality. And so the reality is the hydro-illogical cycle. Start on the bottom, drought makes you aware, you become concerned, you panic, and then it rains. And then forget it, nothing happens. And that, that literally is what happened in Georgia. Nothing changed. But now you may be saying, but what's wrong with that? It was a drought, and a drought by definition is abnormally dry weather, and eventually you return to normalcy. Well, can you say climate change? But even if you don't believe in climate change, the dryness is really quite palpable. And in the case of Georgia, what's going on is that this drought was no different than earlier droughts, but it was more severe. Well, why was it more severe? One simple reason, population growth. You want the elephant in the room of every environmental problem? It's there's too many of us and we're growing too fast. Population growth. In the situation of Atlanta, they add about 100,000 people per year to the metropolitan area. They have the hideous traffic jams. They have a, a part of Interstate 75 that's just a bottleneck. It's bumper to bumper every day. And they figure they have to do something about it. Now, what they're going to do is to widen the road. The road, ladies and gentlemen, is already 15 lanes wide. And they're going to end up with a road that's 23 lanes wide. Why? These are people who do not want to look at themselves in the mirror and say, maybe there's something about what we're doing that ought to be the focus of our, of our attention. So what are we going to do about it? If I've convinced you that we've got a problem, what are the solutions? Well, it may be simple-minded, but I think it's basically the problem of supply and demand. And the demand for water comes in a variety of uh, ways. One of my favorites, and I think one of the most indulgent things, is this photo. This is Kohler's power shower. Uh, if you'll notice, it has 10 shower heads to get her wet, uh, each of which has enough water pressure to, pay, to take paint off walls. Uh, so this is, this is very popular in Phoenix, which is why we in Tucson look down our noses at people in Phoenix um, for their sort of profligate water use. Uh, another example would be bottled water. Um, I was the first to blow the whistle about bottled water uh, about a dozen years ago in my book, Water Follies, um, particularly the use of spring water that interferes with blue ribbon trout streams and, and the like. Uh, at that point, virtually every student in my class would have a bottle of water uh, next to them. Uh, now they do, but it's a recyclable water and it's tap water. Um, as you know, bottled water costs about a thousand times more than tap water. It's no better than tap water. It's not regulated as well as tap water. It's really quite, uh, quite stunning. Uh, rather than go down that, that um, argument, I would instead say, if you've not seen the Penn and Teller skit about bottled water, how many of you may have seen it? Yeah, it's, it's great. So, so it's on their Showtime cable channel, and go check it out. So it shows a fancy California restaurant, but instead of a, uh, a wine steward with an apron over his arm, it's a water steward. And he's presenting the patrons with this menu, this, this water list rather than a wine list, and he's describing the features of this water. And, 
And the next scene, you see them sort of swirling this water around in a glass, sniffing it, you know, and commenting about its arctic flavors and glacier, you know, stuff like that. Then, then the clip goes to the backyard where Penn's out there with a garden hose filling all the, the bottles of, of water. <laughs>